things going. Uh, we were in chapter 15, right? Page 179, the centrality of the gospel. And unless I'm missing it, I, I didn't search through the videos, but I do not believe there's a video for this. Um, and I think it's kind of too bad because it's a very, very good chapter. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad one to start with as you get into you kind of have a, a, a good this, does this every time at 9.10 when I don't silence my phone and when I do silence my phone my wife tries to get a hold of me and I'm not available <laughs> <laughs> I the church did that one not ring? Well, no, the second time. Was that the second time then that you uh, called the church? Really? Yeah, I've never. That's wild. Oh, okay. Um, so, phones, aren't they wonderful? Uh, the centrality of the gospel. I'm going to read some things and then we'll kind of go through it. He starts with uh, the illustration of the, the dad on a camping trip. And just saying, just shouting, just do it. Sometimes as parents, that's that's what we, we just want results. We just want them to do it. But is that really what we should desire? No, we shouldn't so much desire the outcome. We should desire the principles that are burned into our our very being that we would be before we would do. It's not so much the doing of it. We want them to change. We want them to uh, show evidence that there is something at work in the heart and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is doing a change in the inner man and they are becoming different people and the outcome is different. So um, that's our desire. He goes into that. Um, the next paragraph under the Gospel is Central. I'm just going to read just a little bit here and we'll talk about that first paragraph. The gospel was the center of Apostle Paul's entire theology. <coughs> Remember his words in Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation of everyone who believes. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just, at, just at his, as it is written, the, the righteous will live by faith. What does he mean there? This righteousness that is by faith from first to last? What does Paul mean? Yes. I, I think there's possibly two different meanings. And that would be one, you are saved by faith. And then it says the righteous will live by faith. So it is from the very first of your relationship with God to the very last of your relationship God with God. The thing that is constant, two things, grace and faith are constant through that. And we have to keep trusting God. I also think it could mean that everyone from the first person to the last person that has trusted Christ and the reason I think and I, I don't know which one I would choose if I had to choose one but it says at the end of verse 16 for the salvation of everyone who believes Jew first Gentiles so that that is a first and a last as far as the first people the last people um, but it's true that the just shall live by faith not just the just shall be saved by faith, but shall live by faith. So if we're not living according to the truths and principles of the gospel, we're not walking by faith. We're not pleading. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. So if we're not walking by faith, we are not pleasing God. You know, I think we could probably just sit here and talk about that one statement. If 
we're not walking by faith, we are not pleasing God. Because we would go through our day and say, well, was I walking by faith when um, I screamed at my children because they weren't listening to me? I mean, it's probably a, a lot that goes into that scenario, but was I patiently leaning and trusting in God to do what only he could do in my child's life or was I trying to manipulate by anger or by threatening or you know whatever and I think there's a lot that we do that is not by faith that we don't think about um, so um, that is the gospel the power of God for salvation by faith and that we should live by that we may conclude, the next paragraph says, from this passage that Paul really believed the gospel was for our salvation, but he also believed that the gospel was for Christians. In fact, verse 15 of this passage, Paul wrote that he was looking forward to preaching the gospel to the Christians in Rome. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Paul found joy in the gospel and never moved beyond the gospel because he knew the gospel was the power of God for salvation, including everything for an initial calling by grace to justification to ultimate glorification. We never move beyond the centrality of the gospel. Now let's tear that apart just a little bit. Why do you think he was eager to preach the gospel to Christians? You might take that paragraph and just put it in different because words. We can't move. We can't. The gospel is the core. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do should come back to God's word. Yes. To grow. Yes, but what specifically about the gospel? I mean, that how that Jesus died and he was buried according to the scriptures and he was ra rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is it about that that is valuable for those who have already received that, received Christ as Savior, for them to hear that again. I mean... To keep being reminded that what Christ did for us. Okay. All right. Um, so we don't need the message again in order to have salvation. No. There would be some that would say, no, you can be saved more than once. You need to be saved more than once. You can lose your salvation. Because that's not true. So, so it's not for that end. But it is for. What, then, what purpose would it would it serve to be reminded of what he's done for us, so we could be thankful? That would be true. What else? If it's cemented, <coughs> it's, it's easier for us to pass it on. Okay, and that's one of the reasons that I try to give the gospel often in a Sunday morning, not necessarily. You know, if there's somebody there that needs to hear it, great. But also, if there was nobody there who, or, you know, who knew, can the pastor really know if, if, if there's nobody there that's unsaved? No, he can't. But um, would it be of value to hear the gospel again for the, for the result of them understanding it better as a believer and better able to frame it to my unsaved friends? Yes, that is a, that is a, a good possibility. Anything else? I think for me, when I think about it, it, it humbles me and encourages me and makes me realize like how much I don't deserve that. And praise God all the more for it. Yes. And I think you're hitting on the reason. I, I, think, I think you're hitting on it. Um, 
Jerry Bridges, have you guys read much of Jerry Bridges? Uh, um, he, oh, oh, what's his what's his famous book on faith? Um, no, I got two copies upstairs. But beyond that, he he writes uh, a, a lot about grace. Grace is a topic that. Um, Many people have, I call it sloppy agape. You know, they, they're talking about grace. It just covers a multitude of sins. And so whatever, you, it, it, they take that to say, whatever you do is fine with God. It, it's fine. It, no, it's not. He hates sin. <laughs> and it's not okay that we just gloss over everything, saying grace covers all that. And, and it doesn't matter what you do. And, and so it... No, that's not what Titus 2 teaches us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and, you know, that, that we would live godly, righteous lives. And so, um, but he, Jerry Bridges, has a really good grasp on grace, and there's this one book that he's written, uh, Transforming Grace. <clears throat> In that book, he says, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day and it's very much along the line David that what you were saying that we need to be reminded that it was by grace we are saved it is nothing that we and it does humble us you mentioned that it humbles us when we think of me being saved by grace every day and it it brings about this understanding that my relationship with God is not based on works it's not based on what we do. Now, let's bridge that over to our parenting. Why would that be such a valuable piece for us to anchor our thinking into as parents? It's the only, well, <coughs> because I read the book, it says the only hope for change. So of what God did, there's forgiveness. And yeah. so it teaches, we can teach our children there's hope. Right. Because of what he did for us. Right. <coughs> Is our salvation a little bit based on what we do, our works? Yeah, a little bit after. I mean, after you're saved, you should see okay. the works. <laughs> Gotcha. But not. I, I said it intentionally. I, I was like, I don't know which way to answer this. <laughs> we don't have to be saved. So you're right, Pam. <laughs> After the, the fact, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I The way I explain it is I draw a line that represents our life, and the cross <laughs> is at a place in our life. And I say, before the cross, works has nothing to do with, with our relationship Get with God. After the cross, yeah, we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works, it says in Ephesians 2.10. So after the fact, yes. But it's only, the truth of it is, I can't do anything good without Christ. According to Romans 3, there's none that's righteous. According to Isaiah 64, all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So no, not even a little bit of works. But here's why I'm making the point. We parent sometimes with the idea that works have something to do with our goodness. So um, we're, we're all, when we have a child who's rebellious or, you know, not listening or not responding to biblical teaching or instruction, what we are prone to look for is the behavior. <clears throat> well, don't do that. If they don't do the wrong things, it's going to make life for mom and dad a lot easier because we don't have to stay up late. We don't have to discipline. We don't have to worry about the result of that sin in other siblings. There's just a whole, it just makes our life a whole lot easier. And, you know, better <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't make our life better what makes our life better 
is conflict and resolving conflict biblically. That's what makes our life better. Um, it, it sanctifies us. Um, I'm so glad for godly people in our lives that <clears throat> when we were going through hard uh, parenting time, that over and over, godly people in my life would say, do not disregard what the Lord is doing in your life right now. How he is using this event to sanctify you. And that's, that is the gospel. And so preaching, our, preaching the gospel to ourselves every day reminds us that what I have with God through Christ is a relationship based on grace through faith that without the forgiveness of Jesus Christ I would be without hope Rhonda said and, and so the basis of our relationship with God is the gospel the basis of our the relationship that with my child and I is based on the gospel and the basis of the relationship that the child has with God is based on the gospel. And so it must be the central part of our parenting. And we must get to the heart and refuse to just be involved in behaviorism. It's been kind of fun to talk with Nick these past couple weeks. <clears throat> He's dealing with kids that are in a treatment center that just don't behave correctly. <laughs> and so um, it's it's been kind of funny <laughs> to um, to recognize the you know the behavior it, it that's not where it's at. That's not the behavior. We got to get to the heart. And if we don't have the wherewithal to be able to get to the heart, then we don't have the tools necessary. Isn't it funny though, with, with Christian parents, um, they, they leave out the most potent, powerful tool they have, and that's the gospel. They, we buy, if we're not careful, we buy into what secular humanists try to tell us is the answer. And we, we're, they don't have the answer because they don't have the gospel. They come up with what they have because they don't have the gospel. And even if they do, they're not allowed to use it. But we are. And so we don't disregard the most potent, powerful tool to change the inner man. And, and instead, we need to run to it and, and major on it. So... Um, um, okay, the, about a third of the way down on page 180, the fact is that humanity is sick with a disease far more virulent than the Spanish flu or le leprosy or AIDS. The disease is sin and we all have it. We are just as bad as the Bible says. There is no one righteous. Not even one goes on to say in Romans 3, 10 through 12. Not only are we all sinners, but the wages of sin is death. That's the truth. So even if our kids behave perfectly, are they going to heaven? Without Christ, they are not going to heaven. So their biggest problem is dealt with in the gospel. Um, so I, I like this next paragraph. God is righteous and holy. He cannot and will not overlook our sin. If we are able to escape condemnation and death, we need two things. What are they? sentence. Forgiveness and righteousness. There you go. We need those two things. We need forgiveness. Be 
because we have sin and that sin has destroyed a relationship with God and God is a holy God who cannot look at our sin or, or cannot look at our, ourselves because of our sin we cannot come close to him so we need that no matter how much good things we do we still have the, for, the need for forgiveness uh, if, if a guy was <clears throat> convicted of murder and he said I tell you what let me out of prison and I promise I will not sin anymore the rest of my life I will not sin um, well you're lacking something even if it was possible for you to be righteous you lack something and that is the punishment of what you did to get here that is still in, in effect you still have 40 years left on your sentence or whatever it's a life sentence whatever it is so yeah, your promise to do righteous that if you even could do that that's only half of the you know the, the, the necessary uh, results to get you out of here because you did what you did now if the president would come and commute or um, what do you call it pardon pardon then now we're talking but even that doesn't deal with our sin with the just judge with God it's like we try to teach our kids there has to be consequences for your actions when you're not following God and his word right you know it's no different if we're an adult and we do stuff yeah. like that it should that's be the right. same thing that's right and so it's important to teach our children about forgiveness um, there is a big difference between asking, uh, uh, apologizing, and asking <coughs> forgiveness. We can go and we can say, and it usually the, the setting is this. Child A has done something to violate child B, and child A is asked by the parent, hey, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to go and apologize to your brother. And he goes and he says, sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> there that's better <laughs> how <laughs> what difference was that well, I said the right words okay I love you, <laughs> you <know? laughs> how's that gonna fly yep. what, what, what are we teaching our children we're teaching them salvation by works we're not teaching them the grounds of the gospel. And I think even further instruction is necessary, not necessarily every time, but we need to tell our children, listen, the reason that we need to do more is we're patterning this after the relationship that we have with God. And what did God do when we sinned? <coughs> he forgave us, yes. He forgave us our sin. And so we need to get to a point of not holding it over your brother seeking forgiveness and granting forgiveness and so asking forgiveness is a big thing um, when you ask forgiveness of somebody you're being vulnerable to them because they may not forgive you, you but you're asking would you please forgive me now wait a minute the recipient of that could be well tell, tell me what you did why would you need forgiveness? <sighs> because I stole your bicycle and I used it for a day without, you know, telling you. And I left it over at the school. And, you know, whatever. Own up to what you did. And so you're acknowledging your sin. Is acknowledging your sin important with the gospel? Yeah. It's called confessing. We confess our sins. And so that process is really important. So I, uh, whenever I hear, well, uh, I apologized, or I ask my children to apologize, don't ask them to apologize. Get them to the point of admitting they're wrong and asking forgiveness. Did you ask them to forgive you? That has to acknowledge their sin. So uh, that, that part of it is big. 
the righteousness part is is just as big. It's amazing that God for Christ through Christ forgave us. But it's also amazing that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might have the righteousness of God in him. That God substituted something. He made it <coughs> our sin for his righteousness. Let's swap. So Christ took on himself our sin and we in exchange take on his righteousness. And it's only by grace that that can happen. There was no motivation for God except for love and his glory that would motivate him to do that. And so when we teach our children that, we're teaching them that you need, by love, you need to love one another and, uh, and do that and realize that the only righteousness is through the gospel. Why is that important? For them to know that any righteousness is through the gospel. Let me make it easier where I'm trying to go. We believe salvation by grace through faith, right? What do others believe a false way to get to heaven? Salvation by works. Works. So that's what's in the focus here. If I believe that I can be righteous by any other means than the gospel, then I'm adhering to salvation by works. Um, how does behaviorism follow salvation by works? Okay, as long as you act right, we're good. As long as you don't mess up at the grocery store and scream and kick and we're, I'm going to get you a candy bar. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And that word was that says no change of the heart. Exactly, yeah. You got the result, but there was no inner change. <coughs> And so all change is not necessarily good. <clears throat> what was that, Rhonda? Oh, it's going on. She said bribery. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, yeah. and they should behave because they should behave, not because of the mechanics. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be their motivation. Exactly, right. yeah. And we need to be careful even in the church. <coughs> kids earning their memory verse because of a love for God or a love for Snickers. <coughs> and I'm not saying you you know you can't do that once in a while, but if they're if they've come to know that if I do this, then I will get this. No, 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 no. That's the wrong motivation. And so we need to <coughs> we need to be careful how we how we get to the results that we want. The one is putting the cart in front of the horse, you know, and the other is the, the cart is following along because the horse is driving the cart. And if we're driven by the gospel, if we're, if we're parenting according to the gospel, it, it, it's like this statement that I use a lot, feelings make a tremendous caboose but a terrible locomotive. You know, if I'm driven by my feelings, that's bad. But good feelings, we all want good feelings, right? Well, the best way to get good feelings is when they're the caboose and they follow good actions, so or, or good you know purpose and, and, and everything else. So if we want, um, if if we want good results, the best way to get those results is for them to understand the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's word and understand sowing and reaping, not put the cart in front of the horse. So I'm I'm trying to manipulate my parents to get what I want and so I'll behave but as soon as that dries up then the behavior is gone it, it won't be lasting uh, anything more on that well I think I'm trying to think of how to say this but you know there 
there's times that you're you're just thankful that they they had a good day and everybody was getting along and I just feel like getting everybody an ice cream cone. But how do you do that so that it's not the, I think there's a way to say it that it's not a reward for being good because it should be good. <laughs> yeah. But because you appreciate the job. Well, plus when you have a good day with the kids, you want to do something mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. The other day we went and did something and they were so good. I was like, let's go go to another park. I didn't have this plan, but you guys were so good and we had so much fun. Let's right. go play some more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know that that's bad. I think it's when, uh, when the expectations are, uh, I'm doing this in order to get that reward. And that, that wasn't the case with this, and that wasn't the case with that. They didn't know it was coming. Right. So that's the difference. It's not if you all are good, we're mm -hmm. going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, go ahead, Tanner. I say, biblically, obedience does bring about blessings. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a wrong mm -hmm. thing reward the important part I think is to teach the heart motivation to your child and obviously at a very young age I think that can be difficult because mm -hmm. they don't have an understanding of the actual gospel yet but mm -hmm. the point of think that he's trying to make is that in your raising and rearing of children <clears throat> that should be the motivation to teach because once your child gets to you know teenage years there's no longer as much of a at three years old you can manipulate behavior if you will yeah easier but to at a certain point there's only the only restriction on that is going to be their personal heart relationship whether it's been changed through a uh, relationship with god because i mean I, I remember talking having conversations with my dad like in parenting and he's like at a point he said you're 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 basically leading your child to a point of their actual heart change and then it's their desire to yeah. honor your father and mother, to honor God, to serve. So it's not as much as, and obviously you get, as a child, you will get, you know, we're talking about rewards or whatever, and that's not a, I don't believe that's a wrong thing, but the, the it's kind of like two ditches. The wrong would be, okay, mm -hmm. the only reason I'm going to obey mom in the store is because, yep, at the end I get a candy bar. Now if I obey out of a love for mom, and then she gives me a reward at the end I don't believe that that I think that it's kind of a difference there it's the same picture maybe from the outside but yeah a parent would know the difference I think right in the situation and I think it would be important too that you don't do it every time right, right. you know because then it would be an expectation mm -hmm. um, but yeah we want the motivation to be I want to please God and I want to do what pleases him and not to do you know for a, for a snicker <clears throat> So, yeah, he, he deals with that a little bit here on 1E1. Um, Two-thirds down, sometimes someone will ask, what about addressing the behavior that is wrong and telling a child to do better? Isn't that part of being a good parent? The answer, of course, is that addressing the heart does not mean that you don't address behavior. But since behavior is heart-driven, I have to speak to behavior in ways that focus on heart change and not simply behavior change. So we're talking about the opposite end. We're not talking about reward, we're talking about punishment, but it really is the same principle. Um, that we, yes, we want different behavior, but we're going to go about it through addressing the heart. And, and yes, we want good behavior, but we're not going to go about it in a wrong way. We're going to go about it through addressing the needs of the heart and change of the necessary of the heart. Um, that next paragraph, this truth can help you keep the gospel central in correction and discipline. You must help your children see the heart, uh, hidden heart issues that lie behind your, their behaviors that are wrong. And then he goes into a scenario of a discussion with their children. Um, he also reiterates uh, when we talk about discipline, it is really the form of discipling, discipleship. 
So that takes the form of instruction, not punishment. So that's important. Um, man. Five minutes. Um, okay, so the specific needs addressed by the gospel are the cleansing, forgiving, forgiving, internal change, and empowerment. Um, and he, he, I, I like the way he he addresses those four aspects. Um, Okay, so go to, he addresses on internal change. Uh, well, through that whole passage, he's addressing uh, Ezekiel 36, verses 25, I think it is, to 27. Um, it says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit upon you and cause you to walk in my <coughs> statutes and will keep my judgments and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now if you just take verses 25 to 27 and you say, isn't this what you want from your child? Yeah! I don't want a hard heart. I, I want them to be clean. We had Lukey down at the pond yesterday and he became unclean. Uh, but we want them to be clean. We want them to clean up from their filthiness, their idols. We want them to have a new heart. I mean, we don't want them to have a heart of stone and calloused and hard. And we don't want that, right? That's not the result we want. We want them to have a new spirit within them that obeys and is not contrary to our ways, but goes along with them, amiable, yes ma'am, yes sir. We want that. But all that comes from the inner man. It doesn't come as a result of behaviorism. You're doing the right things, no. God has changed you, transformed you on the, from the inside out, and you're becoming a different person. Um, and, and so that precipitates, you know, the, the forgiveness, the, uh, the, the cleansing, the internal change, the empowerment. Um, is it the cleansing? Oh, the cleansing first, right. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and then the forgiveness and then the internal change, the empowerment. Um, and we don't have time to really delve into that, but that was a really good study. Did anybody pick up anything on that that you want to share? As good as it seems for your child to misbehave and then behave properly, that is not the end game. Because that child could be motivated by many things to get there. There are many ways to motivate your children wrongly to get the right result. But that won't suffice. That won't uh, that won't um, substitute for transformation. We want the real thing <coughs> that only the gospel can can bring. So as good as that is at the time Oh, finally I can take a nap with knowing that my kids aren't going to be out, you know, doing whatever. Or whatever it is, you know. As good as that is, that they're going to behave, oh good, I can go to the grocery store knowing that he's not going to throw a fit. As good as that might seem to you, that's not the end game. 
he still could be on the way to hell. <laughs> and uh, so don't, don't stop short of the gospel. This made me think of the parable of the, of the, the wheat and the tares. Mm. You don't want to raise your kids do this, do this just because I say so, not get to the heart because they grow up. They could have the look of wheat, but there's no substance there. Yeah. If you train them to look at their heart and deal with that, then you will raise. There's a pressure on parenting, a peer pressure, a fear of man that says, I just want my children to act appropriately. Why? To please man or to please God? And oftentimes, if we're really brutally honest, we're, mm, I would look better to my peers <laughs> or to whoever. And <laughs> embarrassing when your kid doesn't behave you know <laughs> right right and we use that excuse and uh, we fall short of the gospel of really addressing the child's heart it's easier to do address behaviors <clears throat> well <clears throat> easier in the long run it sure isn't <laughs> concept that I have been introduced to that said a spanking with your child should take at least 20 minutes because mm. you're going to talk with them and I, I laughed because I was like if I'm in the room with this child for 20 minutes I'm going to be spanking all the other ones <laughs> and that's just going to be a vicious cycle all day long but as the years went on the kids are older because when they're younger it is more to please you mm. they're supposed to I mean I don't know that's how it was for us anyway, I guess. And then as they got older, it changed into who you're actually trying to please. Mm -hmm. And then they they understand that. And that 20 minutes is a really precious time with the kids. I've gotten to where it's like, I just kind of look forward to it. Because <laughs> when they pray at the end, yesterday Marge had said something <coughs> uh, mean to another child that really caught me off guard. That's not Margie's typical. And I sat down and talked to her, and I was like, I, I, I was so disappointed, and she knew that because she knows we don't treat people like that. But I was saying we don't, we don't do that. But why? Because that wasn't nice to him. But this is also God's creation. Mm -hmm. God made him, mm -hmm. and you just made fun of him. So you do need to, to apologize to him. But more importantly, you need to apologize to Christ. And the more that I do that, the more naturally that that comes. Because those conversations at first were uncomfortable for me. Yeah. And it was kind of weird. I don't... Yeah. It was kind of hard to get into that habit. Mm -hmm. But now it's more natural and it's so wonderful. And that was really a conversation about the gospel. <coughs> we are who we are because Christ loved <coughs> us and he gave himself for us. And we are in the image of God. We understand that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We are sinners, and that, but there's hope because Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin, to forgive us, but also to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the more we walk through the gospel with them, the more it makes sense to them, and the more desire through that understanding they will have to walk that way and to the behaviors change because the hearts changed so yeah good excellent well we need to close up shop thanks for being a part of this let's close in prayer father now the hard part is uh taking these principles and and taking them and using them and being responsible uh to bring about children that are uh, pleasing to you and so help us help us to do that uh, give strength in in putting these principles into practice and we pray it all in Jesus name